and just a little bit very yeah, just a very very brief um, introduction to West Country bylines we're a citizen journalism um, paper online paper set up um, on the 26th of July 2020 coming up to our first birthday hoping to hit a million reads by that date and we've really set out our stall to tell people what the new the mainstream media won't and um, so many of the issues behind our food production culture agenda of this moment are things that are not being talked about in public um, and hence the, the need for events like this. Um, the format this evening will be that um, each of the speakers will give you um, a brief introduction to themselves, to their work and to their particular topic and then we will open up for questions and we're going to ask you please to type your questions into the chat and um and then we will um, make sure we get through as many as possible this evening and uh, to cover we'll try to group like uh topics that are that are similar together so that we don't duplicate um and what this so thank you all very much for coming and um i'd like to hand over immediately to robert um the director of um this good earth which has just been nominated for uh, um, an award in the Melbourne Documentary Film um, Festival, which is the, one of the top three documentary film festivals in the world. Um, Robert, can I hand over to you? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm a photographer. At heart, I'm a photographer. Um, but I now make mostly documentaries. And I've authored a number of books, and I'm essentially interested in human rights. Uh, so all of my work really rests upon that that bed. And there's a lot more to say. I've got a very long CV because I'm quite old, uh, but I think I'll pass it on or back to Anthea to. Thank you. We're very very pleased to have um, Sam Knights here, um, a QC from the Matrix Chambers. Sam, if I can ask you to introduce yourself and. Tell us what your angle is. Uh, Anthea, well, thank you, first of all, very much for having me. And it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm uh, a barrister principally working on public law cases. Um, and for the last 15 years, I've been doing a lot of work on immigration and refugees. But when I first starting, started doing public law, I didn't do any slavery cases. They just didn't um, really exist because the legal framework um, in this country didn't um, exist in terms of identifying people as victims of trafficking and slavery. That all changed in 2009. And now I'd say about 75% of my work at the moment is on trafficking and slavery. I'm working um, for victims principally looking, um, I'm looking at cases where people have not been identified um, as victims when they should have been, um, cases where people are wrongly convicted of a, a criminal offences when in fact, um, the reason that they were doing the offence in the first place was because they were a, a victim of slavery and cases where, victims are not getting the support and assistance um, that they need. So that's, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Richard Harvey, again, another lawyer. Um, yeah, what are all these lawyers interesting. doing here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I too am a human rights lawyer. Uh, my work these days is primarily on a, a human right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Uh, but my work focuses mainly uh, on oil rather than the soil, uh, stopping the carbon majors from polluting uh, our atmosphere and our lives and destroying the lives for future generations. So when Robert approached me... No, no, no. no. Uh, sorry. Uh, when Robert approached me about 18 months ago and said, uh, would I like to be a talking head in this film? I said, well, why me? Uh, but uh, he, he's very persuasive uh, and he's made a very excellent film, uh, which I hope uh, you've all seen. And if you haven't, I, I, I was completely blown away by how much I learned simply watching it, uh, as well as the intense beauty of the, the imagery in the film. So 
Thank you very much, Richard. And I'm going to ask Robert actually to expand a bit on the background of the film and your motivation for making it um, before we go into the issue at hand in more detail. Thank you. Uh, well, besides, I, I want to say two things. One is that uh, I would love it if Richard could become my PR person. Um, and the other is, is this just a little story before I start. You know, but Richard reminded me of this. A couple of years ago, I was uh, one of my exhibitions, um, this one about uh, the demise of the British industrial working class was shown. And, I, and after the opening evening, I just gave a little talk and a woman stood up. And she said, Robert, I really want to thank you. You go to the hinterland of our ethics and our morality, and you bring stories back that we would otherwise not encounter. And of course, I was very touched by that. Um, and I said, yes, thank you. Um, that may be true. I think it's certainly true of other documentarists, of artists, and also, and I had never said this before, also of journalists and lawyers. And I think that... Um, that's, that's why, indeed, there are two other lawyers <laughs> in this conversation, because I think that they do what most of us would wish we could do, perhaps, which is to deal with these questions of human rights in such an effective way. So, um, given the name of this conversation, which is the true cost of cheap food, the first question for me is, what is food? And the second question is, what does cheap mean? Michael Pollan, an American professor and food writer, stated clearly, for something to be called food, it must be able to do one of three things, but preferably all three. One, help the body develop and grow. Two, help the body maintain its well-being. And three, help the body fight illness and disease. He said, if it does none of these, it can only be referred to as a food-like substance a food-like substance. With that in mind, I think you find in the film that those interviewed offered many ideas and solutions. And I asked them, what's standing in the way of implementing these solutions? And virtually every single person said either profits or capitalism. And I have to say I was really surprised. Within capitalism, the central goal is maximizing profits, which always means maximizing exploitation of employees' time and energy, and maximizing the corporate use of natural capital without cost, debt, or responsibility for the corporation. These things in themselves should make one ask, can it be true that food is cheap? Those who have seen this good earth may remember Professor Pretty near the end of the film speaking about the first and most obvious way we spend our money on food, which is paying at the till. The second way, which is a bit disguised, is that we pay for it in the cleanup of fertilizers and toxins used excessively by conventional farmers. When I say conventional farmers, I mean the farmers post the Green Revolution of the early 1950s who use huge amounts of of uh, toxins um, in their farming and very large machinery. And these chemicals poison the aquifers, the streams, the rivers, the lakes, and the oceans. And they cause algae bloom that kill underwater plants and fish. This government's Natural Capital Committee, I mean, I don't know who's ever heard of that before, <laughs> estimates that we pay 700 million pounds, 700 million pounds, of our taxes each year to clean this mess up. The third way that we pay is that those same chemical poison are drinking water, costing billions of pounds per year to filter and neutralize, which increases everyone's water bills. The above are referred to by corporations as externalized costs, created not only by industrial farmers, but also by the massive food manufacturing corporations producing fumes and slurry, transporting feed for animals around the globe, encouraging the destruction of the <clears throat> excuse me, encouraging the destruction of the Amazon and other previously pristine woods and jungles. They're not held responsible for this damage that they inflict. 
This form of ecocide is largely ignored by governments, but perhaps Samantha or Richard will refer to what's happened in the last few days. And coincidentally, many agribusinesses pour funds into election campaigns, which of course I'm sure we all find a surprise. Professor Purty computed the cost of these externalities. He calculated that for every pound consumers spend on food, they spend another pound on taxes, water bills, the purchasing of bottled waters and food supplements. Now, without land to cultivate, you have no food or very little food. In England, the enclosures of common lands began in the 12th century with the purpose when the purpose was to increase the amount of grasslands available to local lords. This was a direct theft of the commons with armed thugs enclosing the land previously shared democratically by villagers managing mushrooms, berries, herbs, the woods and pastures. The first enclosure by an act of parliament was in 1604 and by the 1750s the parliamentary system began became the tool to enclose the commons which became legal precedent. Basically politicians and monarchs gave lands previously used by the people and controlled by the people to local followers or friends. It was a bit like giving huge PPE contracts to your neighbor's cousin. Today, a third of Britain is still owned by the aristocracy. In 2016, 31 of them received over 11.9 million pounds for farm subsidies from our tax money. With all this land in private hands, often used by the rich people to kill, uh, hunt and kill birds. It means that young farmers struggle all the more to find small holdings. It means that huge amounts of land are withheld from agriculture. And it means that given the subsidies for the aristocrats, we pay a fourth way for our food. Finally, there is a terrible fifth way we pay. Pre-COVID, 60% of our hospital beds in the US Germany and the UK were filled with people suffering from food related illnesses. For instance, there has been an increase of, of obesity in the last 20 years from three to 26%, an increase in knee and other skeletal problems because of carrying excess body weight, an increase in the number of cancers or other non-transferable de degenerative diseases as diabetes, cardiovascular and digestive tract illnesses. Diet-related problems cost the individual days of work lost because of illness, other expenses arising from ill health, and increased insurance rates, but also cause discomfort, pain, and emotional and psychological disorders. This is an indisputable cost of poor, cheap diets. Tonight, according to the US government's, uh, UK government statistics, over 4 million children will go to bed inadequately fed, meaning either hungry or having been fed insufficient nutrients. Well over 60% of food consumed in the UK is ultra processed, meaning children and adults consuming an excess of sugar, salt and nutrient free pap encased in too much fatty protein, carbohydrates and cocktails of flavorants, many improperly tested. So cheap to buy perhaps, but these children cannot function properly. Thus in school, they find, con they find concentration difficult and are often unruly. Through no fault of their own, they become troublemakers, fall behind in class and are condemned to a life of low expectations and low wages because the fifth richest country in the world cannot be bothered to do more than talk about leveling up. And while this is going on, there are 1.5 billion people in the world who are overweight or obese. In no way can food be considered cheap, given the injury it does to the soil and land, the water and air, and so many plants and animal species, and to billions of people. So what do we do? Ken Robinson was a British author and, and advisor on education in the arts. He told this story, which perhaps many of you have seen or heard. A little girl was bent over her desk, drawing with great concentration. 
Her teacher comes over, leans down, and asks, Flora, what are you drawing? The child, carefully keeping her drawings covered, looks up and says, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher says, but Flora, no one knows what God looks like. Flora responds, they will when I finish. As Flora, we need to imagine what we wish to see. We need to be specific about what kind of world we want to preserve and protect. Change will come when people find ways to reclaim their sense of power as individuals in a group with shared purpose. Where that shared purpose is defined as looking inward to ourselves to find out who and what we are and what we want, and outward to our communities and to the wider world, recognizing who and what is in the way of real and immediate change, and then, in concert with others, taking action. Now, I have no affection for the national uh, political class, and I hope that change will come when we stop voting for reactionary nationalistic politicians and begin to support and influence those who are devoted in the strongest possible way to program changes 100% consistent with the goals of 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. That's an incredibly powerful start to this debate. And I was just reminded that um, five years ago now, the RSC, or RSA put out a report, a commission a report, criticizing decades of government policy aimed at making food cheaper, fueling rising obesity and other health problems, and saying that the true cost of that is simply passed off elsewhere in society in a degraded environment, spiraling in health, ill health and impoverished high streets. At that point, five years ago, we, we had the third cheapest basket of food in the developed world, but we also had the highest food poverty rate in Europe. I don't know what uh, if um, Sam or Richard have anything to add to, the, to specifically to this, but I personally have seen no evidence that this has changed and in fact has deteriorated yet further since that commission report. Sam, do you want to to come in at this point? Yes, I mean just on the um, on the on the poverty before I talk about the slavery, the um, UN um, special rapporteur on poverty came to the UK um, a number of years ago, Richard Alston, who's a um, law professor in the US, and the findings he made were really striking and telling. And initially, the government reaction was quite astonishing. It was this just doesn't exist. He's exaggerating. He's making it up. <laughs> and but he had no motive. Why would he make it up? He didn't have any particular axe to grind. And and then actually, uh, um, a, a sort of bipartisan um, couple of MPs went around to some of the areas that he was talking about, some of these sort of forgotten parts of the country, and went to talk to people and came back with the same story. We have really serious levels of poverty. We have it in Devon as well. We have a lot of child poverty um, here. Um, but I wanted to start off by saying, um, and in responding in a way to um, Robert's um, um, comments about um, about the law and the importance of lawyers. I mean, I don't think you know lawyers are actually you know, hugely important in all of this. Of course, rule of law is important, but it's it's getting the um, the stories out and the work that journalists and and filmmakers do in you know in building the public profile of um, of this hidden you know world of slavery is so incredibly um, important and. The people, of course, who come, who actually get to lawyers are just the tip of the iceberg. They, they really are. And there are all sorts of reasons um, for that, um, which I can go into. But I wanted to start by, I guess, talking about you know, what the extent of the problem and where it is in terms of um, modern slavery, because um, I think people think of it often as something which is elsewhere. It's not happening around us. It's not happening in the UK. It's not happening in Devon, but it's happening everywhere. I mean, worldwide, we've got um, 25 million people trapped in forced labour, of which about 16 million um, are exploited in the private sector, supplying goods and services, including food and drink. And we know that slavery exists at all stages in the supply chain, from the picking of raw materials, you know, for example, cocoa or sugarcane, through to the processing, the production, the shipping and the distribution. But in, in the last sort of decade, um, decade and a half um, in the UK, there have been lots of statistics compiled on 
um, on prevalence here. We don't really know how many um, modern slaves there are in the UK. Um, and the um, statistics that we do have are almost certainly huge underestimates. So one way of trying to work out how many people we had in modern slavery was to look at who had been identified by the Home Office mechanism, the National Referral Mechanism. Well, that, of course, is a massive underestimate because, first of all, the, um, the NRM is very, very slow in identifying um, victims of slavery and trafficking, but also most people don't want to go into the system. They know it's slow, there's a hostile environment, they're frightened of coming to light, so they'd rather just stay working in their terrible um, situations. Um, other organisations have estimated it maybe a hundred um, thousand people in the UK who are trapped in modern slavery. That's also likely to be um, an, a great underestimate. Um, it could be um, easily double that, but we, we don't really know. What we do know is that um, it seems to be um, increasing rather than decreasing. Um, and what are the reasons for that? Well, I mean, the work I do as a, as a refugee, migrant and um, trafficking lawyer, you know, I see clients who are um, exploited um, economically because they see no you know, means of making money in, in the places where they live. Um, people who are coming from um, from outside the UK. There may be climate change um, problems, you know, there may be just no work for them, um, and conflict of course is another driver. But we know it's also happening um, in the UK for people who don't ever leave a border, they don't ever leave the UK. Um, we, there are of the, the top three nationalities who are identified as slaves in the UK are British, Vietnamese, and Albanian. And so that means that people with status um, and people who have, um, in theory at least, access to a welfare state are still falling into um, exploitation and forced labour. And if we think back to um, 2004, and um, we'll, those of us who were sort of old enough um, to do so will remember the story of the Chinese cockle pickers and that really shocked people at the time because it highlighted something which I think hand on heart most people didn't know about. First of all most people didn't know that there were you know people, um, Chinese people in this country picking cockle. They didn't know anything about the um, sort of supply chains and the, the gangs that were controlling them and they didn't know anything about the way that they were living. But it was a story that passed in terms of headlines, you know, there was a lot about it and there was, you know, there was an investigation at the time and then it sort of fell by the wayside. And I think we all assumed that, well, slavery was abolished and it, it doesn't exist. But what happened after the um, in the aftermath of the Chinese cockle pickers was that the gang masters and labor abuse authority was established and the idea that it was going to license labor suppliers and recruitment um, agencies and its scope was over the years increased although its budget wasn't so in in fact it's trying to do a gargantuan task in terms of um, monitoring and regulating without really sufficient um, means to do so but what also has changed in the um, intervening years is that our hostile environment has got much worse, our hostile environment for immigration. And so um, the role of the gang masters and labour abuse, abuse authority has, if you like, I think, reformed from being one about trying to protect workers to having um, the scope of almost immigration officials. In other words, trying to identify people who don't have status. And you cannot um, tackle modern slavery in this country at the same time as having a hostile environment um, in immigration. Um, it is not, uh, not possible because what you end up seeing, and I see with my clients time and time again, is that um, instead of being identified as victims um, of trafficking or slavery, they are picked up, um, treated as illegal immigrants and often convicted of criminal offences and then they're, they're, they're subject to deportation. And the lucky ones um, manage to get their deportation stopped by finding a lawyer. Um, often when there is a, their, their, their sort of passage on a plane is booked, um, but lots and lots of people will um, fall into the category of not being able to get a lawyer and they'll be deported, um, notwithstanding the fact that they should have been 
treated as a victim of trafficking and modern slavery. There should have been an investigation into the crime and they should have received support and assistance, which is tangible support and assistance. It means getting accommodation and financial support um, to help them um, recover from their um, slavery and, and move on. What I wanted to just um, talk about um, uh, before I finish is um, one example of how trafficking and slavery um, has sort of you know, ends up in this country in the um, food and agricultural sector. Um, and this is Operation, uh, uh, Operation Fort. Um, and Operation Fort was actually one of the very, very few criminal convictions that we've seen in this country for um, for members of the gangs. Um, so you remember I said that we, that we have a, you know, a huge um, problem in this country and we know it's a multi-million um, pound business for those who are working um, in this as gang, gang members and perpetrators, um, but very, very few people are prosecuted. Eight um, members, um, however, in Operation Fort of a Polish gang um, were convicted of slavery offences in 2019. It was an enormous effort um, for the government, for the Crown Prosecution Service and all the related um, agencies and millions were spent on the um, prosecution itself. Um, it um, came about through quite a sophisticated network of um, recruiters who were working in Poland, identifying vulnerable um, individuals and uh, there's an estimated about 400 people they think were involved although they only actually identified 92 victims. Very few of the victims that were identified spoke um, English so they were in this country really without being able to understand and know the laws of the country, um, know where they could try and seek help if they wanted to. But they were also vulnerable in other ways. And this is something I see repeatedly in my clients. It's never just one, generally never, never just one type of vulnerability. It's a kind of cross of lots of different vulnerabilities coming together. So some of them had been in prison and were struggling to find work when they came out of prison. Um, others had very serious mental health problems. Other one, others had addiction problems. And so what the recruiters did unsurprisingly was hang out outside prisons when people were being released, hang out outside addiction centres or outside off licences um, or outside health centres and they looked for people who were vulnerable and they approached them and they promised them work in the UK. They said they'd be well paid, they'll be accommodated, they just needed to hand over their documents, hand over their ID cards or their passports and then they would be taken um, to the UK. And they were. But of course, um, we, we know that they ended up in horrendous um, um, accommodation. I mean, the kind of conditions that were completely inhumane. Some of them didn't have working toilets, they were cold. They had to go and find their own bedding, mattresses. Um, and they lived like this for years. The gang members made a lot of money. They made about two million in, in five years. The victims were paid, some of them were paid about 20 pounds um, a week. And why did they stay? Well, as I mentioned, they were vulnerable, they didn't speak good English, they would, wouldn't have known really where to turn, but also they were threatened, um, they were isolated, some of the women were forced into prostitution, and they were also fed a series of lies about how they would be treated if they did try and leave. So, of course, they didn't, um, they just stayed there. And the, the, the whole um, network was really very sophisticated. So in, they didn't just use the uh, men to, and the women to, to work um, for very little, but they also got the, um, the um, Polish um, uh, victims who, of course, had status in the UK. They had the right to be there as EU citizens. Um, they got them to um, make applications for loans, they got them to make false insurance claims, they got them to um, sign on for benefits, so they, and then they used that money, they got, got it paid into bank accounts that, that were being controlled by the gang. And they, they, did, they did this operation through a whole series of agencies, labour agencies, recruitment agencies, over a number of years. And of course, some of these recruitment agencies were sp supplying workers to um, big companies. Um, Again, you wonder how on earth did they get away with this for so long? Did nobody make any checks? Did they not check bank accounts? And did they not sort of spot suspicious activity around these accounts? Did none of the employees in the places that these men were working, men and women working, did none of them notice that people seemed to be depressed and isolated and seemed to be very downtrodden? And 
the um, in terms of the employees, no, the answer is nobody, nobody really did notice. Um, one of the um, labor agencies actually had a, um, a Polish woman working inside. So she was a sort of, she infiltrated, she was um, described by the judge as clever and manip manipulative, very, very charming. She was considered by the recruitment agency as excellent at her job. She was you know, considered a star employee. She was brilliant at recruiting people and placing them um, in work situations. But of course, at the same time, she was controlling bank accounts and she was taking um, their cuts and um, they, they saw very little of the money. And so how did, how did this eventually come to light? Really, in a way, by chance because none of the checks which might have happened um, and should have happened brought it to light. But what did happen is the victims one day were at a soup kitchen and they were speaking to a charity outreach worker that was, it was run by a local church. And the charity outreach worker happened to be Polish. And so she was able to communicate with them in their, you know, fluently in their, in their own language. And they, they, by this stage, some of them, you know, were able and felt able to talk. And, so they got referred to an NGO and then you know, it, it went further and went um, up. But as I say, these are very rare, these um, convictions. And, um, and for all those um, eight people who are convicted, there are, you can bet your bottom dollar, there are many, many hundreds of people working in this country um, and exploiting people right now. And the victims, as I say, will um, run into the thousands. Um, I think that's what all I'll say for now. And then perhaps I can come back at some point and maybe talk a bit more about the um, what, what can be done in the law, but I'll pause there and hand over to Richard. Thank you, Richard. Um, listening to that, so I have to say it's hard to feel proud about to be British right now, for all sorts of reasons. Richard. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Sam, for uh, that expose, really. Uh, most of us have to use supermarket chains some of the time. Sam has talked about modern day slavery, which also brings chains to mind. Uh, and she raises the issue of supply chains. Uh, what takes us all the way down uh, the supply chain from uh, what is on your supermarket uh, counter uh, back the way to how it was transported there uh, from where it was grown and what happened to the land to clear the land to make it possible to grow that there. But I, th I think one of the things as a lawyer that's always uh, obsesses me is words and particular kinds of words. And when I hear, when I first heard that word in 2004, that word gangmaster, I thought, is that actually a thing? Is, is there somebody who actually goes to work and says, yes, I'm a gangmaster? It sounds just, it resonates like a slavery overseer. Uh, and uh, it, it just shocks me. Uh, that apparently I just googled gangmaster and apparently there are jobs you can get being a gangmaster or a, a, even a, a gangmaster's overseer uh, to make sure the gangmaster is doing the job properly. Uh, it is uh, pre-Dickensian uh, in its, in its uh, the, the shivers that that sends uh, through me and I'm sure through many others. I'm, I'm sure like everybody who thought it was worthwhile tuning in for this. I'm concerned about what I eat and how it's grown. I look for organic labels and I buy my food as far as possible from local farm shops. I'm privileged to live in Bridport where that's pretty easy to do. But most of us do have to go to the supermarket. And I don't know whether you're a vegan, a vegetarian, uh, or like me, more, more what what our daughter calls a flexitarian, um, and spend eighty percent of my time trying to eat really healthily, and the other twenty percent uh, saying to hell with it and enjoying myself. Uh, but the fact that uh, uh, you know I have a chicken breast from time to time. Last year, I actually 
uh, ate a, a locally sourced steak. So I'm not a purist, um, but industrial meat, again, think of that term, industrial meat. It doesn't sound tasty uh, just to think of it. It's Industrial meat is the world's leading cause of deforestation. And the appetite for meat is growing so fast that at the current rate of growth, meat consumption will rise by 76% by 2050. What does that mean? It means simply there isn't enough land in the world to meet that demand without trashing forests. And we all know what that leads to, of course, more devastating climate change. And so it's, it's part of a negative feedback loop um, that uh, industrial meat. We used to think of red meat as something that was good for our diet. I suppose you know, the post-war generation that I come from uh, was uh, told how lucky we were uh, not to be eating tins of bully beef. Um, the, the Lancet, the medical journal, says that by 2050, in fact, none of us should be eating more than 300 kilograms of meat per week. That would be three chicken breasts or a large steak. Um, and these are useful things to know about what's good for our body and what's good for our planet. Uh, it sounds pretty manageable to me. Uh, we should be eating 50% more fruits, more vegetables, more nuts and legumes. Sounds pretty good to me. And I think we probably all over this past year had the opportunity to do a little bit more thinking about how we live our everyday lives and what we do put in our mouths and uh, <laughs> many of the conversations that we have routinely are about what are we going to have for dinner tonight because we ain't going out to the pub um, we're not going to a, 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 a restaurant or a fish and chip shop we're going to have to do it for ourselves and so a lot of our thinking i'm, I'm sure has revolved around what we are putting into our stomachs and how good it is for us and for the environment we live in. You have Tesco, branding stock as farm grown with nice pretty green lettering. It's very seductive. The products probably are grown in farms, but the message that is subtly suggesting organic credentials doesn't actually say it's organic, but you Enough pretty green lettering will give you that feel good sense. Unless those credentials aren't there at all, what this amounts to is greenwashing advertising. And uh, that's used consciously and consistently by big businesses to create a green ethos for themselves in our collective subconscious. Buzzwords like natural, vegan, eco-friendly, sustainable. They don't actually mean a thing without certifications to back them up. Tesco has a grower's harvest range. Uh, its supply lines are extremely opaque. Uh, it's tied up in a ribbon of green sustainability promises. But although some supermarkets are making some effort to address the climate crisis, it's going to take more than the green wrapping paper to effectively tackle the problem. The thing that strikes me as watching the film and learning more about ecological farming is that ecological farmers work with nature. Agribusiness is in a constant war against nature, trying to eliminate all the pests that interfere with their uh, profits spraying chemical in insecticides, fungicides, herbicides that, as Robert has mentioned, leach into the water systems or are emitted directly into the air. They come back in one form or another as deadly pollution to our ecosystems. I've come to believe that only organic farming can save us. The non-organic farming methods cause unprecedented levels of soil degradation. Big Pharma says 
organization, big farming organizations say we have to be more efficient and get more intensive. That completely neglects the need to restore soil to health. It just takes all the goodness out of it and puts nothing back in. That's not sustainable. The right to food, and there is a human right to food, it's like all basic human rights. It's about people having control of their own resources, not governments, and certainly not transnational agribusiness corporations whose greed and reckless destruction are nothing short of criminal. But let's not get carried away with the starry-eyed starry -eyed idea that calling their actions ecocide will change anything anytime soon. We've got a nice tidy new definition, bright and shiny, came out of the box only yesterday, uh, and uh, I'm quite impressed by, the, the, uh, as a lawyer, by the definition. But as a lawyer who's practiced at the international uh, criminal tribunals, I know that wait, you're going to have to wait something like 15 years before ecocide actually uh, has any kind of legal meaning or effect. So let's not wait until then because we simply don't have 15 years to wait. We do need action now. And the right of people and the right of us as people to define our own phys food systems is achievable if we are prepared to fight for it. Ecological farming is central to food sovereignty and food sovereignty provides a sustainable alternative to corporate controlled greed and chemical inputs. Farmers and consumers have to exercise their right to choose their own production system. In practice, what can we do as individuals? We can question sustainable labeling. I find nothing more shocking than to go into a supermarket and find organic bananas wrapped in plastic. If only bananas had some other form of protective covering and didn't need the plastic, you might wonder. We have, as individuals, got to take action in terms of what we buy and what we're prepared to pay for it because as Robert has said we are paying in so many more ways than at the cash register. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I think just to set off because we're um, a relatively small group I think if people want to raise their hands to ask a question we'll go to you to take those questions. I just wanted to kick off with you know, obviously, we're a we're a privileged group. Um, almost certainly, people here have either the the intellectual ability or the financial wherewithal to be picky about our food and to want to know where it's come from. Um, but for the parents of those four million children going to bed without adequate food, um, nutritious food, this is not an option at all. Um, it's you know, it's too ex it's expensive enough as it is. And clearly the direction of travel with this government, with the, the nature of the, the, the deals that it's striking, most notably with Australia, with lower food standards, lower animal welfare standards, and this mantra of um, cheap food. Um, it's hard to know how, how we're going to get government policy to change but, uh, and company policy, because it can't be us. It can't just be us fringe few, really, who are going to drive change. So I wondered if the, the panel wants to comment on that. Shall I say something about the, the, the regulation around supply chains? Because I think that's quite a good starting point and it fits um, well with what Richard was saying, talking about earlier. So I think what's really surprising is how little legislation and regulation there is on supply chains. And the, the Modern Slavery Act, that, which is um, 2015, which was heralded as this incredible, wonderful piece of legislation that the UK was gonna take around the globe and showcase and you know, what a modern model slavery act should look like, has just a single um, provision, section 54, on controlling supply chains, but it doesn't really do very much at all. 
All it says is it requires companies with a turnover of more than 36 million to publish a statement on how they're tackling modern slavery risks over their operations and in their supply chains. Now, that statement could actually say something like, um, we're not doing anything. The requirement, in other words, is to publish a statement. There's no requirement as to the substance of what that statement should be, or and there's no requirement for them to actually actively do anything. So it's incredibly light in terms of requirement. Um, you've also got some soft law, um, UN uh, guiding principles on business and human rights guidelines, they're called the Ruggie principles, they're soft law, they've got no binding effect whatsoever. But I think where we see hope is in consumer demand and in social media and, um, and in sort of outing the bad guys and people praising the good guys. And we can see already that some companies are trying to kind of march ahead because they know it's good for their business. They don't want to be seen as the bad guys. So um, a company like Unilever, for example, um, spent quite a lot of time actually improving their employment practices to start with, hiring more women. There were very few women um, historically in senior positions. So they started looking at the, you know, their, their sort of operations across the board. They started looking at their supply chains. You know, palm, everybody knows there's a problem with palm oil, but yeah, palm oil is of course a useful um, ingredient for lots of products, including chocolate. So some palm oil is better than other palm oil. So they thought about where to source palm oil from. And they, they sort of led, you know, if you, I think they led the way in many respects in, in terms of being proactive. Um, and I think, although we can sort of say, well, you know, the, the laws, um, the laws, you know, very soft it is, and we, you know, one could try and lobby for more law, but I think actually much more likely in terms of producing change is to be an active consumer and do what Richard was talking about, is to think really carefully about um, choosing your food because, because you can. I think uh, yesterday, uh, Samantha, Richard and I were discussing this question of consumer power. And um, we talked about a man named Cesar Chavez, who some of you may remember in the 1960s and 70s, I think. He was a land worker, a, 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 a peasant farmer who had come north into California from Mexico and um, basically said, these wages are unthinkable and our treatment is unthinkable and helped to form um, a union of Mexican workers. And one of the things they did to encourage people to come on side was to say to those California growers who will not admit to the existence of the union, we will stop buying their oranges and their lemons and so on. And the fact is it worked, it absolutely worked. And if you remember at the beginning of this century, um, in, I think it's about 2002, um, the oil tanker drivers went on strike. And um, Blair said, nothing doing, we're not going to capitulate. Three days later, they capitulated because they recognized that actually that group of people could simply stop the delivery of food. And so I, I think the thing is, that what I'm saying is that we in the population have a lot more power than we think we have. What we need is to organize ourselves. Now that isn't easy because then we have to the question, well, how do we organize ourselves? And I think the problem we have is saying, are, are we who are conscious of these problems going to stand up and bring others with us and discuss what are our dreams for our society and what can, can we do? But I think that's what has to be done. I think that we who know, who understand, need to start a discussion with two friends. And then we have to ask them to ask two friends to come in and so on until we can grow a movement in each town and city and say, okay, you know, if Morrison's won't do such and so, we're going to target them. We're going to say, we are going to, to, to march on them every day until they capitulate. And they will capitulate because it's too embarrassing, it's too problematic, and they can actually try and make profits elsewhere. So I think, I think that there is a lot of potential. Um, we have to overcome, though, huge uh, cultural problems 
which have been planted in us by the neoliberals since Thatcher and Reagan. That's a whole other discussion, but it's, I think, a discussion worth having at some time, how that culture has changed our consciousness, how we've gone from being uh, we-centered to me-centered, and how we've gone from being conscious of um, ourselves as producers to conscious of ourselves as consumers, and how we decide that we understand our culture and ourselves through psychology, which is individual, rather than through history, which is collective and actually a hell of a lot more relevant very often. Thank you, Robert. Richard? I don't want to come in. Uh, I, I, I don't know about you. I, I don't like it to be in a situation where uh, all three panelists have to answer and then one other person gets a chance to ask a question. Uh, I see Jenny Budden's hand's been up and she's got a very interesting point that she's made in the chat. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Let's go, go for it, Anthea, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Anthea, you're, you're off. Yes, Jenny, uh, please go ahead. Yes, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to sound extremely depressing here. I mean, I took the points you, you made, um, Anthea, about how the hell do we do something about this, and it strikes me from a totally different context of living in a new build that companies now don't actually care about their reputation. All they care about is profit. And at the same time, you've got lots of people who work, women work these days, great, I'm all for it. But they used to spend a lot of their time cooking meals. And when you get in, you're tired. You don't want to cook meals because you just want to eat something. And it seems to me, I don't know whether it's because I'm just getting old, that there is such a mountain to climb. And as some of the speakers have alluded to, the whole of the sort of um, societal norms of neoliberalism are about my responsibility, nothing to do with other people, nothing to do with companies. And we all have very limited power. Fortunately, like you, I have privilege. I eat organic food. I'm careful where I shop. But I know that most of, lots of people around where I live do not have that power. And I suppose I'm saying, please cheer me up. Give me something to hang on to <laughs> that means that I think we will get better. Because if we don't crack this, how on earth are we going to crack climate change for all those little tots that are being born now? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Richard? Yeah, I, I'm delighted to come in on, on that um, because uh, I don't actually agree that um, it's uh, left to us as individuals. And I don't agree uh, that companies no longer care about how they're perceived. Uh, that's not to be starry-eyed about it. They know they can get away with a hell of a lot. But there are new powers emerging on the block. Uh, there is the power, obviously, of social media, and not just of individual action on social media, but collective group action. There are so many groups out there now who are really drawing attention uh, and calling out companies uh, that are engaged in uh, greenwashing, you know, pre pretending that their products actually are helpful to the environment, whereas in fact uh, they are certainly not helping and they're probably making things a damn sight worse. So I think you know, we see the right rise of a new generation and that's what excites me. I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, and I was an activist in the 60s, and I, I've been an activist ever since. Uh, but I'm, I'm really turned on by, oh God, that dates me, doesn't it? Say I'm really turned on. Uh, <laughs> by the new generation that is forming Fridays for Future, that is filling the ranks of um, uh, the uh, environmental groups like Extin Extinction Rebellion. There's so much youthful activity out there that I don't think we should feel too depressed. We certainly shouldn't feel that it's uh, 
just us as individuals against them as massive corporates, because they really are getting very nervous. Um, and uh, certainly working every day to bring about the, the downfall, downfall by legal means of uh, Shell, BP, uh, Total and Exxon. Uh, I see huge enthusiasm by young people, huge inventiveness and the ability to um, just sticker your local supermarket uh, with uh, the demand that they stop uh, plastic packaging. Uh, get to the checkout counter, take your goods out of their plastic wrapping, put them in their bag and leave the plastic wrapping there for the supermarket to deal with. They'll get the message eventually. But I think we can do things as individuals. And I think there are so many groups that we can participate with. We won't agree with everybody in every group, but we are collectively much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Pope. I think um, I think people power is a is a is a big area where we should feel more um, more optimistic. For example, in in the recent pressure on on advertisers on the far right channel, for example, where people power got people to got companies to change their minds about advertising there. Um, one of the suggestions that came out of our last session from Philip Colfox was that the burden should must fall more on the manufacturer and the producer of processed food um, to demonstrate that their product is, as Robert was saying, actually food and not a food-like substance. And, um, and obviously one of the key roles for us is, is to be aware of those companies that aren't doing that and keep putting the pressure on them. Similarly, to know which companies are exploiting their workforces or making use of, of slave labor and boycott those companies and draw it um, to public attention. Robert. Uh, I think Jenny's question is probably the most important question this evening so far. Uh, I think the, the problem is that what I've felt over the last six or seven of these Zooms I've been on in relationship to the film is that people feel, some people feel helpless. They feel, all right, well, I put my rubbish in the right bin, but really that's not actually going to stop climate change. And I think we all understand that now, that, that, that you know, we can do our part and we should do our part, but there are other things that need to be done, particularly in the, in the, in the things that Richard was talking about. There's some very good reference point for what is and isn't happening. Um, a, a man named Bill McKibben, who some of you may know is a, an American activist and author, he, he has an article once a week in The New Yorker. And you can get this for free. Um, if you, if you uh, I think Google Bill, Bill McKibben, New Yorker, you'll find it. And you can get his article delivered once a week to your, um, to, 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 to your computer. Um, and what he does is he lists the stuff that has happened around the world that isn't very good. But he then lists the court cases and the the collapses of corporations in terms of you know demands made against them for such and so and it's a it's a really interesting because it's like a scorecard and and i think that what i felt over the last number of months is that there's an awful lot of stuff that none of us know about and basically it's because if you think about it who controls the press i mean in this country it's what four or five individuals in the state and most of those people are on the side of the large corporations, because they are large corporations themselves. So I think it's it, that we have to really appraise as carefully as possible when we can collect information, like from Bill McKibben, what is and isn't happening. And we still have to say, I think, as I said earlier, we need to organize amongst ourselves. We need to stand up and be counted. We need to find those ways to do it in our villages and towns and our cities. And I think that's, that's a really difficult question. But what I do know is that projects that bring people together to do things actually bring people to stand next to each other and say, oh, I, I didn't know you could do that with an aubergine or, uh, and so on. And it creates conversation. Conversation creates familiarity and people actually begin to understand each other as human beings. And that creates some commonality that, that binds people together. And they can then say, why don't we do such and so? And, I'll, I'll daringly mention Leon Trotsky. Um, 
Russian revolutionary who developed the idea of what he called permanent revolution, which means that you make a set of demands and you win those demands. And the moment you win those demands, you say, actually, that's not enough. We can actually demand more. And I think that's what we need to do is get this ball rolling somehow now, once we, as long as we still carry with us the post-COVID notions that we can be good to each other, we can share with each other, we can be kind to each other, we can help our community. Thank you. Anthea. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, do we have other questions, please? If you want to raise their hands, we will take that. In the meantime, I think another area of concern is access to the law and the ability to, uh, for the law to actually have teeth. Um, Sam, you made a number of references to to laws that are toothless, actually, or you know, do a jo do a job optically but not act. Um, and this seems to be an ongoing problem, an ongoing challenge, especially in a government that's not very keen to have um, scrutiny or, or for the law to bite. Yes, I mean, one of when um, Robert was talking earlier about the Californian um, collectives, it, it reminded me of the you know, huge discrepancy, um, in fact, between um, a situation for workers, um, migrant workers in the US as compared to migrant workers here. So um, in, the, in the US, migrant workers, you know, those who don't have, and those who don't have status, legal status in the US can actually sue in many states um, for unpaid wages. So if they're being exploited by the agro business that's getting them to pick fruit, they can they can bring a claim in the court. And there's been lots of examples um, in Florida, the fruit pickers there, they've sort of collectively organized, they've got very good NGOs speaking um, in, to them in Spanish and sort of um, helping them bring these claims. Um, compare and contrast to the situation um, in the UK where the courts for decades have been tangled up in this, this complex legal issue of, about whether you can whether somebody who doesn't have legal and legal status in the country can sue um, for unpaid wages and you know, a very sensible and humane thing to do would be to allow people to um, sue for unpaid wages um, and but that but that hasn't happened I think accessibility of the law is you know is generally is a is a huge problem um, and I mean, not just in, in this sort of area of, of, of food, but it's a problem across the board. I mean, obviously the you know, areas of law that I'm working in, in immigration, um, there have been masses of uh, reductions in the legal aid um, and the scope of legal aid in this country. So um, there are lots of areas, in fact, nearly all areas of immigration that are outside legal aid. Um, only refugee claims are still eligible for legal aid and victims of modern slavery can access um, legal aid. But um, if, you've, if you're subject to deportation, for example, um, and you don't have a refugee claim, no legal aid for you. And it's very, very complicated um, deportation law. And people are discouraged. I mean, we've been in the chat, people have been talking about the hostile environment. Um, people are very discouraged from coming to light um, in this country because they fear that they're going to be su you know, subject to the hostile environment um, and are going to be subject to immigration control if they do come to light. So they'd rather not keep their heads below the precipice. And of course, you know, We've got a Home Secretary at the moment who is doing everything she possibly can to make the situation even more toxic. Yes, and also we've got a number of EU citizens who are going to hit the deadline of the 30th of June still without settled status and um, facing that risk and challenge with this government refusing to extend that deadline. Yes, right. Well, I think, I mean, I think they have, they will extend it by, by, um, by, by a certain amount, but we're going to, exactly, we're going to have um, a ludicrous situation for people who've been here for decades, who've worked here lawfully for decades, um, may find themselves uh, you know, subject to the hostile environment and un unlawfully here, which is, you know, not, obviously not good for them, but it's not good for the wider public either. Mm. Just, just addressing your area, particularly then, Samantha, are, should we be writing to companies 
to ask them what their policy is on on modern slavery uh, beyond that their statement that they're obliged and also you know with that as you said only covers companies with a larger turnover yeah i mean i think i think the consumer has um a lot of power in this area for the, for the reasons that you know the, the, the rich have spoken about social media um is is huge and we you know we, we can we could we can choose where to shop supermarkets are very seductive and they they there's also a lot of wastage people waste a lot of money because supermarkets persuade you through all sorts of sort of subtle means into buying far more food than you than you actually need but i mean on your question of whether we should be writing to companies absolutely why why not i mean most good companies have a, a much more comprehensive uh, modern slavery than uh, a slavery um, statement than they're actually required to as a as a matter of law and lots of companies with turnover of under 36 million will have modern slavery statements why because they know people are you know beginning to care about these things and and so they want to be more transparent um, the other thing that could happen quite easily with the kind of technology we had um, blockchain technology um, is to get companies to tell us and have it on their website exactly where each of the bits of their product come from it's just not that difficult to do it might be it might be might have a cost it might be time consuming but that's something that you know certainly big companies or bigger companies can absolutely afford to do and that would allow people to understand where the sugars come from where the coffees come from um, because the, the the laws around labeling of food and telling you where your food comes from country of origin uh, are, are very are very are very few in fact you don't have to tell consumers that much at all um, so I think, yeah, I think collectively um, we, we can do, um, you know, as a consumer, we can do um, a lot. But I think probably the most, um, the best thing one can do is make kind of, you know, an active choice about where you shop. Um, I mean, what we've seen in the pandemic is that local producers in the Southwest have done well. There's a wonderful collective that um, I uh, use in my backyard, which sources products from all over this area of East Devon that I live in. They deliver to a number of drop-off points once a week in towns, um, including um, Bridport, Seaton, Axminster, various others, but they'll also um, deliver to your door. And you know, you know where all the stuff has come from because it's all incredibly local. And I wouldn't say that it's actually um, hugely more expensive than supermarket shops. The difference is, I think, the lack of waste. Um, and as they get bigger, they're able to um, think of ways in which they can also try and reach out to people who don't want to spend um, as much on food. So they're all these these small producers are thinking about how to get food to um, you know to food uh, banks and what they can do as well. They're, so you know it's a, it's a sort of win win. But they will only thrive if we support them. Thank you. Um, we've got a comment here uh, from Alex. I think we risk seeing this only through our eyes. We are engaged in these issues. We're politically aware, etc. For the vast majority, cheap food is great because it allows them to spend on other things. For others, even our, even our cheap food is barely affordable. In order to achieve the change that's so desperately needed, are there enough aware and engaged people to actually achieve anything? Surely this is a numbers game, as with everything. Isn't it actually legislation, preferably international, that is the only real solution? I'm happy to come in on, on that. Um, uh, it isn't one thing or the other. It's all of the things that Alex has, has cited. Uh, there are, uh, there is no obviously no single answer to anything. Uh, legislation is only as valuable as it's enforced, and uh, enforcement is absolutely key. How do you actually check uh, that uh, the foodstuffs? Uh, were the product of slave labor conditions. Um, that's, uh, if, if the foodstuffs are being um, raised in Brazil, uh, in forest lands that have been cleared uh, in order to produce the crops uh, that are not for human consumption, but they're soy to produce animal feed that go into the chicken 
and the beef. Um, and, and so it is a very complex chain that we're, we're looking at here. But Sam is absolutely right. Uh, we can demand that companies do publish their chains. And these demands are being made constantly uh, and so, some effect is being had to that. There's, there's no quick and easy answer. I d desperately wish there was. Uh, but I think uh, I'm really intrigued by one cute little idea that has occurred to me as uh, they do sometimes in, in events like this. When Robert talks about the definition of food and what is and what isn't, um, it would be great to bring an advertising standards authority complaint uh, on some of these uh, alleged foods uh, to demand that they be relabeled. Um, and the Advertising Standards Authority is a business body and it's not there to protect the people as much as it is there to protect the businesses. But once in a while you can score big uh, with relative, relatively little um, outlay. Uh, you don't need to have a, a massive campaign to make it happen. Uh, but that, that's certainly one of the things that we can do. But International legislation uh, requires international investigation, international courts, and uh, there, was, there was a thing a while ago that was quite useful um, at coming up with uh, consumer protection rules. It was called the European Union, but apparently that's gone out of business. Um, and so that makes our lives a, a little bit more difficult uh, here in, in the UK. Also, we have the teeth, the, the sanctions. I heard a, I read a shocking statistic in the little book, Black Book of Data and Democracy, actually, that when Facebook was fined $100 million for breaching on how it would use WhatsApp data, that actually to Facebook was the equivalent of a $13 fine. If it, you know, for, for somebody earning fifty thousand, so that these the punishments have to be meaningful, and I'm sure we all saw the hundred million fine and thought, wow, finally, you know, a bit of a they get a bit that's a hit to their profit. It made no difference to them whatsoever. So I think that, that that's one of the key things we've got to see. We've got to see um, in so the quite, most meaningful consequences. A written off business expense, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to add, add something, if I um, may, on the international um, down to the domestic law, because often I think international law, especially in the area of human rights, doesn't necessarily do very much. Um, but um, what it can do um, is inspire states um, to pass domestic law. Um, and, and, and sometimes if, you know, if, you know, very specific types of treaties conventions get ratified at an individual level, at an international level, there's an expectation that there'll be um, an implementation into domestic law. And that's what you saw with the trafficking legislation. So the, the impetus for the trafficking, legis trafficking legislation was actually the Bush administration wanting to get tough on the um, war in drugs, you know, the drug running between the uh, Central America had got out of control and they, he wanted better international law to help um, get prosecution. So, you know, data, um, um, information and that sort of thing um, improving across borders. But what it did was push forward the um, a trafficking the, uh, bill, which became known as the Palermo Protocol. That in turn inspired Council of Europe legislation and the Convention Against Trafficking, and then an EU directive. And it was the, con the Convention Against Trafficking at the European level, which then prompted the UK to pass its own legislation. So we didn't have any legislation really on trafficking until 2009, um, but that was inspired by international regional um, law. And I think that's you know, an interesting example that international law can inspire. And maybe we'll see that with the echo side. Um, I mean, um, Richard's obviously worked um, a lot in the, um, in the International Criminal Court and can speak about the limitations, um, particularly of that court. But the, the fact that it's got this sort of profile now, it's an international crime, is huge in lots of ways. And let's see whether it leads to better domestic legislation.
So Richard. I, yeah. Robert, sorry. sorry, Robert, <laughs> go ahead then. Uh, I, I think just listening to what people are saying, if we take a step back, a kind of uh, summing that up, it's the laws are not right. Once the laws are instituted, they create fines that are totally meaningless. That I think Samantha said earlier, or maybe in our conversation yesterday, that it takes years until the laws begin to be able to be used practically. Um, people feel lost. And, and meanwhile, we have nine years to solve these major problems. Personally, I don't see this current political establishment, at least in this country, really even being interested in it, other than talking about it and doing nothing. And I think we have to say to ourselves, well, what do we do? I mean, how do we actually bring change? And I think that the only hope for us is that we, the people, do it on the ground. I can't see any other way it's going to happen. And it means that we have to leave our comfort zones. It means that we have to do things like go out on the streets and talk to each other and, and make plans and do things that are really, really pointed and start becoming, you know, the, 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 the light on the hill saying, this is what people should be doing. I mean, Bridport um, is or has called itself a rights respecting town. And yet, actually, although it's a very tolerant town in many ways, there are things that people have to look at and think about and challenge themselves with. And all of this is very difficult for individuals. But I, I have to say, and I'll say it again, that, that we, have to, we, we have to do it. We have to do something. Because actually, if we don't do it, who is going to do it? It's, I, I feel a great sense of loss, maybe a bit like Jenny did. But there is this theory about solastalgia that an uh, um, Australian academic came up with which is this desperate, empty feeling that we are surrounded by forces which are huge and which are destroying our environment. And we have nothing to do about it. We can't do anything about it. We don't even know what to say about it because it seems like fate. So I really think that we need to find a way to begin to act ourselves as, as people on the ground. And following up on that, um could if we could um, alight on some targets for that campaign to get you know to really push for them to be able to say whether it's food or not that would be a very interesting test case to start with wouldn't it and get people engaged with the whole idea of is food really food uh, i have to say i have lists of ideas um, literally two pages of ideas which i'm not going to say now because it's I don't think it's the right environment, but I also think that it needs people to think about it and discuss. But I have a lot of ideas, and I'm sure that many other people in this group have ideas. This is what we need to do. We need to get together, discuss these ideas, and say, okay, how do we act? What do we do? What's our dream now? A point has been made here is that, so thanking us for the for the evening, just saying this comes at a time when I can see gangmasters being used to supply farms to supply the lack of labour. It's a very real. It's a very real danger, isn't it? Uh, th thanks, of course, to the fact that uh, we can no longer call on the EU to supply <laughs> uh, that that labour, um, but we've taken back control. <laughs> Indeed. Right, I'm sensing we haven't got any any questions waiting, and um, I'm sensing that we're sort of drawing to a close. So I think uh, what I would just ask each of you to do is if 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 those of us on this call are going to go away and do something, what would you want us to do, Samantha? Oh, I would. I, I I'm a great advocate of buying um, food locally. Um, and, and and sourcing it from our wonderful suppliers that we have um, down the road. And the, you know, then of course you know where your food is coming from. You can be fairly sure of the, of the supply chain. So that's, um, I guess, my, my plea to people, support our, yeah, support our wonderful local producers, those who are doing 
good good things with their food. Richard? Sorry, I was quickly searching for a, a link that somebody had asked me to post. I'll do that in just a second. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, that we are more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, I think companies are concerned about what we call the social license. That's the, what we allow them to get away with. And they are conscious about being named and shamed. Uh, and so if it's something uh, as important as plastic packaging, if it's something as important as uh, telling us, please tell us what uh, your supply chain uh, is for this product, or please tell us what your uh, published company policy is uh, on uh, the uh, use of uh, modern day slaves. Um, uh, they, they are forced to either tell you, oh, oh, we don't have a policy on that, which isn't a good look, um, or they're, they're forced to come up with one. Uh, and then of course, how you hold them to account is another question altogether. Uh, but we are many, they are few. Thank you, Robert. Well, I, I have to say, I, I'm already uh, trying something in, in Bitport. Um, there are about 12 organizations that deal with food and we're trying to bring them together to sit down with each other and talk. And that's slow um, and it's been evolving over the last few weeks. Uh, and I hope that it comes together sooner rather than later so that we can actually see, is there a way that we can help each other, that we can find common goals and that we can exacerbate the contradictions in the system as best we can, or as Samantha or, and, and Richard are saying, finding those organizations or those companies who will be sensitive to our responses and actually just start pointing our fingers at them and saying, if you carry on doing this, we're gonna carry on doing another thing, which is you're not going to like. Um, and um, see where that takes us. But I think uh, what I hope is that people begin to feel that they are empowered and we need some little victories to lead on to bigger victories. Absolutely. And we'd be obviously West Country Pylons would be thrilled to cover that and talk talk about that to inspire other people to, to adopt the same policies. And maybe we should also be running a name and shame, at, but also a praise, a praise and celebrate um, mm. kind of account of what people are doing, because I think it's obviously very, very important to reward those who are doing the right thing and taking us in the right direction. And one of the things I'm suggesting, having done for my sins advertising, is knowing how powerful it is to suggest that if we can bring the right people together to create uh, visual, very visual uh, advertising campaigns that we can distribute to shop fronts and wherever else we can put them up, like advertising, like hoardings, to convince people of whatever the issue happens to be we decide we want to, to push for that week or that month. So whether it's about a human right or about what people's rights are or whether it's about food or whether it's about a, a negative attack upon something or, or, as you say, a celebration of something else. I think all those things are, are worth considering. And I think that that's a way we can also really communicate with people by creating this thing, these beautiful images, these beautiful graphics, uh, which will hopefully convince people. Well, that's on the boards. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Samantha and to Richard and to Robert for joining us this evening. And it's been a very stimulating um, debate. And I think, it, as, as you, we've all agreed, it's up to us at the micro level to do, some, do what we can. Um, and certainly I'm taking away a message about needing to give this more coverage um, in our paper and in all the, net, well, in all the bylines network, actually. This is a major issue. Thank you very much for coming. Our next session is on July the 13th, where we by Kyle Taylor, who wrote the little book, Black Book of um, Data and Democracy. Probably one of, you know, data is the new oil, really, in terms of value, the data grab and um, measures to suppress the Electoral Commission's ability to impose fines or take things to court. 
data has never been a hot topic. Um, so hopefully you'll join us for that event on um, July the 13th. Thank you all very much. Um, stay safe, stay well, local. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good you night. Very much. Oh, I'm, I'm really, all right.